Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. In this video, I'm going to be covering a new series on the Algamorn Republic. Part 1 will be before the Algamorn Republic, and it will be the seeds of this Republic. We're going to discuss who the Algamorns are, why they're important, and how they ended up in Algamor. With that out of the way, let's begin. Before we get into many of the things that they did, let's first talk about who they are. The Algamorns were and are an ancient Ketovite race. The ancient Ketovites are usually tall and dark-skinned people. They usually have an affinity with magic and are more closely intertwined with um, philosophical and things of that nature that require more of the mind rather than your arm and a sword. They were more of a, it's kind of hard to explain right now off the top of my head, but they were not really known for their, like, warlike stuff. Ah, anyway. The thing about these um, ancient Ketavites is that they were actually reddish in color, which wasn't too uncommon, but most ancient Ketavites on uh, Ahri at this point were um, actually, like, black, dark, or brownish colored. These, um, the Algamorns were likely from somewhere in the Desertlands. I say Western, but we don't actually know where they came from. The Algamorns could have lived at any point in the Desertlands. And in fact, it's probably, um, factual that they migrated throughout the Desertlands throughout time. Now, the Desertlands are very hot, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, as I said before, they are very sophisticated, and they became obsessed with various scholarly interests. Things like philosophy, for example, were quite popular in Algamorn society, and it was considered more honorable to be a philosopher rather than a warrior. Now, this doesn't mean that the Algamorns completely neglected their army. In fact, they became some of the best warriors on the continent, but they had a more interest in magic and um, philosophy rather than, you know, just brute conquests everywhere. Though they definitely did that a lot. They would migrate into Algamore somewhere around the early third era, somewhere around a hundred. Now for those of you that have seen many of my previous videos and do not know of this new timeline, the third era of my old universe was moved to the eighth era, so this is a completely different third era for reference. And um, the reason for the migration is unknown, very likely due to drought, droughts and high uh, temperatures. But we'll see how the Algamorans say they were forced to migrate here in a second. I'm going to talk about the Dojera, an ancient text which was written by a mythical king named Manifaka the First. This um, ancient, um, let's just call it writing, details Manifaka's conquests in great detail through depictions of warfare. In particular, it shows the sacking of Fashuta. I, I always keep mispronouncing that, but it's Fashuta. Fashuta. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I write names and it has, it's difficult. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is actually quite an interesting depiction because it depicts Manifaka as the attacking army having a hundred men, while Farshuta was depicted as having a hundred thousand men. Now, a hundred men attacking a city with a hundred thousand men, that's impossible by every stretch of the means. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But, um, there were many other details in this, including him holding a hundred heads at once. Um, him standing over his enemies, you know, all that stuff. And then, for, but the most famous is the sack of Fartush, Farshuta. I keep saying Fartusha, but it's Farshuta. Um, obviously, um, the Dojara is very shaky on many parts, and it includes a lot of divine intervention. Now, to be fair, in my universe, divine intervention is not only very common, but it's very true in many cases, as obviously many gods are real in my universe. However, when I say this, I mean it can get very, very over-exaggerated. 
Like, for example, back to Foshuta, um, when he was attacking the city with 100 soldiers, when they had 100,000 defending it, it was believed that he uh, summoned a massive amount of firestorms and um, thunderstorms that were sent in by the gods. They first struck them down with thunder and rain and drowned many out. And then they sent in massive tornadoes and storms of thun not thunder, of fire, which um, it is believed that it helped Menefaka conquer the city immensely. Um, this is also seen as to be like a way to describe battle mages instead of divine intervention. Somehow, the battle mages just got completely forgotten and um, they got replaced by the gods. But we don't actually know what happens because the only source of that, if because the only sources of that event um, go with the idea that somehow he attacked and won a city with a hundred men when there were a hundred thousand men defending the city, which is just impossible in every stretch. Um, when I said earlier about the migration into uh, Algamor being unknown, the Dojoa explains that the Algamorans were fleeing from a, quote, firestorm, which is sometimes seen as a metaphorical way of depicting of describing the increasing temperatures. The fires, the desert lands, as I said before, are very hot to such a point in which throughout time sometimes they could get as high as 200 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer days, which is absolutely insane. Now, of course, this is one of the only and best sources of the time, and it was carved deep into the Algamoran Desert into a cave that no one really knew about until it was discovered far into the 8th era. Which, as I said before, the 8th era is the 3rd era of old. And finally, the Dojoa actually depicts many of Algamor's, like, it describes some of Algamor's old gods and practices. Speaking of which, let's talk about the Algamoran religion to know more about these people. The Algamorn religion was known as the Zin Zinicha. The head gods are Zinni, or Zinna, the god of the sands, storms, fire, and the earth. Zinni is depicted as a heroic, almost all-powerful scorpion god who helps the Algamorns greatly. There was also Zayamar, the goddess of archery, horseback, and love. And she is depicted as the wife of Zinni and the mother of Atta Zinni. Atta Zinni is the alternate evil self representing the dark of Zinni's titles. Now the Atta versions of characters is very common. In fact, just about every god has some sort of Atta version of themselves. Which I don't get, I'm not going to get into it too deeply, but the Algamorans kind of had this good and evil. And, you know, they were trying to focus on the good and repulse the evil. It's a huge, like, reflect on Algamorn culture itself, but I won't get into it in this video. I think I will cover it in the future, however, especially as the Algamorn sources become more, like, written down and complete. Two periods of times in which we actually understand largely what was going on. Well, what you would understand if you were like in the ninth or 8th era studying the history in that sort of sense. That's what I usually mean. Um, Atta Zinni, however, is really the only one I'll be talking about because he is the most common one. He's kind of mm -hmm. like, when you think mainstream Algamoran, you'd think of Zinni, Zayamar, and then Atta Zinni. And those are like the three main ones. Just like how when you think of like, Greek mythology, you would think of uh, Zeus, perhaps Her Heracles, or Hades, or Poseidon, you know, that sort of thing. That's kind of the three that you would think about when you think of the Algamorn religion. One thing about the Algamorn religion's uh, mythologies and stories is that it is very, very fucking confusing. And that is not an overstatement. I'll share with you a few pieces of the mythology that would puzzle and confuse many people for centuries, if not millennia. For example, um, Zenny and Zinni, I, mis uh, I misspelled these uh, names a bit. Um, Zinni and Atta Zinni are described as one of the same, like they're the same people, just good and bad. 
However, Ata Zinni is also described as having is his mother was Zayamar, while Zinni's mother is not Zayamar. So these two gods that are one of the same have different mothers or different creators, which is very confusing. Like, how can you be the same and yet have different mothers? It's just like confusing. <laughs> um, Zinni and the great gods would have a quote, massive battle where the gods would eventually combine into Anavorgor, who would remove his 20 eyes and cut them into 20 pieces each to create 400 gods. Or, well, probably to recreate or resurrect them. This battle is sometimes depicted as a love battle, take that as you will, and other times it is seen as an actual battle. So... So let's say, like, if you go to, like, a temple of Zayamar, it's likely going to be more seen as a, quote, love battle, which is very fucking vague. And other times, it'll be depicted as an actual battle, which is also pretty fucking vague. But this is one of the most famous stories, and according to the story, because Enervogor actually wanted to, like, I guess, save the world and recreate the gods... So he kind of sacrificed himself, and that's kind of part of the story, but it's still quite confusing, and I might go into it in the future if you're interested. Um, Zinni, now here's another topic about the mythology, is that Zinni dies over 30 times, and there are no stories of resurrection or anything to explain such. This is a very common trope within the Algamorn mythology, with characters randomly dying and then coming back without any reason. As if they never died. But yet, somehow they're still alive, even though it's said they die. It's it's almost like a, in some cases, it's almost like a really badly written story. Where, like, you kill off a character and then you, like, just introduce him back into the story without any explanation as to how he came back. Or even as far as, like, none of the characters even react to his death. That's kind of what it's, what's going on. And this is a perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that was funny. Anyway, um, one of the common tropes is you know obviously people dying, well gods dying a lot and then just coming back. In fact, it got so bad that one god, Methusi, um, the god of the death and the blade, was said to have died over a thousand times, which, I mean, that's almost impressive. Dying a thousand times and then just coming back without any reason whatsoever. <laughs> but let's move on from uh, mythology to King Man Menefaco the I. Now, Menefaku the first is seen as both mythical and historical. Specifically, this means that Menefaku is seen as historical, yes, but we don't know what's true and what's false. He is largely seen as being born somewhere around 1990 of the Third Era, which is about just short of 200 years short of 2,000 years after they begun to migrate into Algamor. Which is a pretty big, like, jump. Um, during this time, he began to rise to power in the Algamorn tribes. He was eventually able to defeat and murder his brother, also named Manifacker, and eventually he was able to raise an army and usurp his father's tribe. A lot of this, especially according to the Dodra, whatever I called that, um, ancient source, tells this and says that he was blessed by the god Zenny, Zinni, who I don't know why I called him Zenny, but his name is Zinni. And he was said to have been blessed by him, which allowed for him to conquer his neighboring tribes. And eventually he would conquer most of his neighboring Algamorn tribes and states, which would allow for him to set up the kingdom of Algamor which at the time would be called um, Agurs, because that's how they referred to themselves. The Algamorans called themselves the Agurs, or Agurs, one or the other. Now, most importantly, Menefaka would create something known as the Vesius, 
the Vesius would become very important because it would turn into the Senate later on. Or, well, maybe they never even turn into the Senate, but that's kind of a thing I will explain about later. And then eventually he died by a, quote, thunderstorm. If you could tell, um, in the Algamoran history, things like thunder and fire are very common. And so, take that. <laughs> take that. Anyway, we're going to actually talk about the Vesius now. The Vesius is very clouded in its early history because it lacks sources for much of the early history after Menefaker. This isn't just the Vesius, but this is just the general period of time after Menefaker. The kingdom would likely expand outwards and it probably experienced civil wars. We say this because there are a number of other historical artifacts that depict Algamorns fighting against Algamorns. Um, there was also the story of Manifacker II, who fought with the Vesius. According to legend, the Vesius was able to eventually defeat Manifacker in the Battle of Agus, Agus, in 2177. Um, the Casa Vesius in 2180 was a declaration which declared that the kings of Algamor had limited power. Now this... This is crazy. This is like the effect of like the Magna Carta in England or whatever or something similar to it being declared in like the Bronze Age. Because this period of time is very far back. So this is very important in the Algamorn history. And another thing that would happen is that the Vesius University is founded, believed to be the oldest of this kind. Remember how I said earlier that the um, ancient Kedavite um, Algamorans had an affinity with things like all sorts of stuff. They were more intellectual people. That's I think that's what I was looking for, intellectual people. Now you can see that they start to follow upon this by doing things like building a university, a university, which is one of the oldest of its kind. And in fact, the Vesius University actually would stay around for a very long time. And then we have another important figure who would be named M Mevores the Fourth. It was said that he was born from the deserts below him, directly a gift from the sand god um, Zinni. Um, Mevores would eventually dismantle the Vesius after a civil war. Now this is where a very important um, part of Algamorn history comes to play. It is believed that after this point, um, he was actually cursed by Zinni because he did not want him to dismantle the Vesius. Um, this eventually leads to Mavoris, um rebuilding his army, rebuilding Algamor and a huge army in 2030. Now, this is a very important thing because when Mavoris, um dismantles the Vesius after a civil war, it's believed by the Algamorans that uh, Zinni um, actually cursed him. And I think I'll talk about this later, about how the Algamorans view a republic. Because this is kind of the part where it said why I put the title as the seeds of a republic. Because remember, the Vesius is the first signs of like a republic of sorts. And I'll explain what the Vesius even is later on. But you can see now that he is... Um, now to, now just move on. The invasion of Mashka was when, um, you know, what's his name again? Give me a second. Mevarez. I hate when it does that. This is when Mevarez um, attacked the Mashkan kingdoms to his south. He led an army perhaps as high as 300,000, which for Al Gamor was very high. He would conquer many cities, including Hafuda, Aguta, Ekes, and other cities on the map. It was during this time in these conquests that he would send um, hundreds of thousands of settlers into Mashka throughout the years. Now, the attacks were brutal, and there were many historic battles that were quite, you know, they were big. For example, the story of Tel Waiya, Waiya, would become very important later on, but we'll call that irrelevant at the moment.
You'll know later on. Um, during this time when the Algamorns were invading, he would begin to deport the king of Algamor would begin deporting entire kingdoms worth of populations later on. Um, he was also engaged. This conflict to oversimplify would be very brutal and involved numerous battles all across the land that would lead to hundreds of thousands of deaths in each one of them, at least according to the sources. This um, conflict would only end somewhere around 2270 when Idiz Idizir I would die in that year, and this would end the campaign as afterwards they were treated back north. Um, this um, invasion was actually highly recorded by numerous people, so the invasion was likely true. Particularly, they were recorded by the Mononorthans, who I'm just going to say they are definitely irrelevant and will never come up again. I have a series dedicated to their successors, um, let's just ignore that part. There were many depictions across Mashka of sackings during this time, and thus why we know that the sackings and destruction were brutal. Mavores was trying to replace the people of Mashka with the Algamorans, and he was massacring entire cities or deporting them up north to where they'd hopefully, you know, die in the deserts or they would start living in where the Algamorans used to live. Another thing was that they were also likely... Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> Um, this is likely seen as a massive migration attempt due to the hot weathers and the desire to move to a better climate. Despite being better than the desert lands, Algamor is still largely a desert. It's very flat, yes, but, um, it is still very hot, and Mashka, um, is a lot better. Mashka is much cooler than Algamor. and, um, it has a lot of rivers, which allows for fresh water. That and a bunch of other details makes Mashka a very great place to settle and live at, which is why they were trying to attack and invade. The Algamorns were likely outnumbered despite rallying a huge army. As I said, it could have been as high as a hundred, I mean, three hundred thousand. However, the Mashkan kingdoms were infamous for their huge armies, and combined, even in this period of time, they could have easily fielded millions. Many sources depict the Algamorns in a good slash evil light. <laughs> so its control over Mashka is unknown. We don't actually know what was going on, but effectively the Algamorns depicted themselves as heroic and, you know, honorable, brave, etc. And then the Algamorns were like, and then, I mean, the Mashkins were depicting them as like the most evil people you could think about. I don't know why that glitch was happening, but anyway. Eventually, um, Mavores would die somewhere around 2 to 60, and then 10 years later, his son would die. And ultimately, the most important fact was that it was believed that the result was to have influenced by the god of curses and decisions, Iphazan. Now, this is very important because this actually feeds into the um, Algamorn's view of how a republic is better than a monarchy. Because, um, look at this, Mavores destroys the Ve Vezius, and then he does all this great stuff, and then he invades. And it turns out to be a huge disaster. And so it was painted in a way that it was like, oh, hey, look, this monarchy, these monarchies were cursed. And when the Vezius was around, we were prosperous. So that means that the gods favor a republic, then they do a monarchy. And that eventually leads to them preferring a republic over a monarchy. And thus, once again, that's why I said in the title that this period, this period was seen as, should be seen as the seeds of a republic. Now, this invasion would likely have devastated the Algamorn kingdom causing a huge loss of life. Algamorn settlers in Mashka, for example, were kept as court wizards, mages, scholars, or as foreign battle mages. As I said before, many um, Algamorns were attempting to move south, and now that the invasion failed, many they were forced to retreat back into the kingdom. 
However, potentially as high as millions of people were still trapped in Mashka, either willingly or not. And thus, Algamore lost a huge amount of population. This would lead to the Algamorans destabilizing, and they would eventually break up into local kingdoms. These local kingdoms eventually um, broke apart even further, and then they returned into city-states, though with more land due to, you know, desert. <laughs> this also caused loose alliances and local wars to occur. The loose alliances in particular are very important because... Well, you're in the middle of a desert and there's very little resources, so many of these city-states would um, form confederations with each other to defend each other and give each other um, supplies. And during this time, a lot of places would see their own version of the Vesius. Let's talk about the Vesius real quick. The Vesius, during this time and throughout much of its early history, was made up between 150 to 300 men, sometimes up to 500. There was a 501st Vesius, who would become known as the Vestura. The Vesius would vote on issues, with the elderly senators usually having a higher influence. Things at this time, however, were very informal. There were very few laws, if any, that were um, written into place. This allowed for flexibility as, first of all, as there were very few laws that could prevent them from doing certain things, but it also times led to the Vesias growing very corrupt and soon enough only a few men had complete power. There's also this huge other thing about factions too, where more powerful Vesias would form factions with many others and, you know, that sort of thing. This would also vary wildly. The Vesius only means collected men. And in this term, it really just means like a group of men making decisions. And you could also see this as a democracy in a way, but the Vesius were, they were chosen. This wasn't a pure democracy. They were like elected and there were local elections or, well, they weren't really elections. Things were a lot differently. This is only an oversimplification and a more in-depth, like, analysis. Perhaps its own video would have to be looked into. But this is kind of an overview of what they actually were. And now, let's talk about its technological innovations. The Algamorans had made significant technological um, innovations during its city-state period in particular. This would include things such as actual ad aqueducts and water tanks. As you know, Algamor has a huge... Um, Algamore, to oversimplify, um, it lacks a lot of water, but it still rains quite a bit, and so they build aqueducts and water tanks in order to, you know, move around and store water. Um, worst case scenario, they would actually forge underground rivers that were oftentimes in engineered through magic and purification. What I mean by magic is that you use magic to, I guess, create water, but also this is quite dangerous because pure magic turning into water is very dangerous. So you have to purify the water and remove the magic from it. Um, the fact that the Algamones were able to do this just, you know, it shows you that they were very advanced being able to purify water and create underground rivers or aqueducts and water tanks above. They also would write advanced. They would also um, create advanced writing. They eventually would invent something known as desert paper. Now, I'm not exactly sure on the core concept, but it's quite different. And the desert paper literally uses animal hides and sand to create it. And it required very few animal hides, just kind of adding it in there so that it could help with some things. And that would become Al Gamora's desert paper, which allowed the, for them to write many things down. There were numerous universities and libraries which were built, which were oftentimes funded by kings or veziuses. Now, as you know, there were many local confederations that were formed, and oftentimes um, these confederations would make agreements to fund things for each other especially the big cities funding towards the little cities in return for, you know, certain things, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then there were some two very important things. 
the um, Algamoans um, were quite into alchemy. But more importantly, they began chemistry itself. Now, this isn't like modern chemistry or anything, but they began to study the world around them and try to figure out what made it up and sort of thing. They made theories about things like atoms and such, but obviously because they have nothing that we do now, their chemistry was a lot different than ours, but I thought I'd mention it here because it would be very interesting. Now, the city-states. City-states oftentimes would form loose confederations for survival. Many major cities would look f <laughs> Major cities would most of the time lead these confederations. And the cities that were major were as follows. Sathicus, which was the home of the great temple of Zinni and Zyamar. Agamemnon, which was also a religious site but it would become more important as the seat where eventually the capital of the Algamon Republic would be found. Um, Mizaruth was a scholarly place where a lot of scholars and people of that nature would go to in order to study. It was very well known for its many libraries and universities as well. Tarzi was known for its scientific field. Here, the universities were quite large and, well, they studied a lot of scientific stuff here. Um, Magadarsha was mostly known for the University of Magadarsha. This university was absolutely gigantic during its peak, and it was the largest university of all in Algamor. In fact, some believe that Magadarsha's university was actually the largest on Ahri for the time for thousands of years. There was also Duzoman, which was a major religious site. There was Aldirza, which was another major place for scholars to go to. And then there was Venz, which was importantly the home of chemistry. Well, at least Al Gamora's version of chemistry. And then the final city, which was probably the most important, was Mu'a. Mu'a which was on the coast. Mu'a would become very powerful as it controlled trade and had a large navy. It also had a much higher amount of water than the other places. And so Mu'a became eventually the largest city of them all. However, things would change eventually much later on during the fourth era when the overseer invasion occurred. The overseers are a huge topic, which I will not cover in this video, but essentially this invasion would catch the Al Algamorans off guard, this, which would lead to Algamor's quick conquest. <sighs> Resistance was oftentimes quite heavy in some parts of the Fourth Era, which would lead to um, the overseers invading these cities and then completely destroying them. And I'm not just talking about, you know, sacking or whatever. They were leveled to the ground to such a point in which people, even decades afterwards, would never have known that a city was here unless they saw it for themselves. This would, lies to, this would give rise to a legendary wizard known as Agamagja, who was essentially a... He essentially was a wise old wizard that helped a group of five or so heroes defeat the Overseer um, God, who is named Vilmacus. Um, Agamagshaw's story... Um, in the aftermath of the Overseer invasion, um, the Algamorans would unite under a cause after the Overseer ended. And this actually made them believe that monarchies were destined to be cursed. But this also made them believe that the Algamon... <laughs> what am I saying? The Overseer invasion is largely believed to have been the reason why the Algamon Republic would be formed. And in its aftermath, the Algamon Republic would eventually begin to dominate the region. And it would also create a long period of peace. However, we won't talk about that in this video. We're going to stop here. Tune into the next video where we will cover the creation and the rise of the Algamon Republic. And that's about it. I really do hope that each and every one of you um, enjoyed this video. Have a good day or night.
and I'll see you all another time.